it's just a blessing to be here. I'm uh, thankful to be alive, thankful to be a part of the brethren here. That was an interesting chapter you read in, in Joel. Um, it seems like the Lord has used and will use locusts in the future um, as a punishment, as a judgment on people. Um, I did a study on locusts a couple of years ago, or, yeah, I guess a couple of years ago maybe. And an interesting fact about locusts, um, locusts are grasshoppers. But, and they're not sure exactly why, um, like when they're around here, when we see them, they're just grasshoppers. and They, they, can, uh, they can damage plants, um, but they're not as destructive as they are when they become locusts. When they become locusts, it's usually brought on by um, a weather change or change in climate. Usually big droughts can bring it on, but they're not sure exactly all the reasons that contribute to it. The locusts start breeding faster. They get closer together. Their coloring changes, and then they start swarming together. They become agrarious, which means they, they're no longer living separately or independently, but they live together. And, uh, and as their numbers grow, they reach different levels of classification. Like, it starts off as, as, I think, like swarms, and then if it gets bigger, and depending on how large of a region it affects, it becomes like a, yeah, it starts at like a swarm, and then it becomes um, different levels of graduation up to like a plague. And they're, they're actually known as a plague when they reach that classification. Um, there are... If I remember right, all the continents except for two have locusts on them, and, and people suffer from them. Does anybody have a guess what the two continents are? What they might be? Antarctica is one of them, and what's the other one? North America. Up until about 120 years ago, uh, North America was affected by locusts. And they were devastating. Um, there are a few of them left, and you have to go up into the northern Rocky Mountains to find them. They're all frozen um, in a big pack of ice. That's the only place they know of that they still exist, and it's disappearing as it melts uh, from season to season. Um, the accounts that I read of them was they were so devastating, the ones here in North America, that you could be outside, and in the days when everybody had clothing made from natural fibers and materials, uh, when locusts move across the ground, they come, in, they come in a rolling and sweeping motion. So as some land, there are others coming behind that have already devoured and they land. And they continue that way until everything is brown because they've eaten everything green. And if you happen to be in their path when they would land, if they were aggressive enough, they could eat your clothing right off of you. Um, I think it's something that we just can't, can't relate to. I, I remember reading a statistic about them. And when they are bad enough, when they reach plague status in other parts of the world, they can affect, and I can't remember the exact figure, it's either a tenth of the world's population can suffer from hunger or a fifth um, from one bad plague of locusts. So they're incredibly powerful. Um, and I imagine that's why, that's why they've been used um, in judgment against people. I was, I was blessed by the opening. Uh why don't we all stand and stretch a little bit, and I'll just pray. And then, Father, thank you that we could uh, be here this morning and meet together and um, be blessed by your word. Help us to edify each other, to um, encourage each other, to speak truth, to honor you in the things that we talk about today. Please be with me as I um, try to share a little bit out of your word. Teach us, Father. Help us to serve you. Help us to go out into the world and be effective disciples for you, reaching people for your kingdom. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I wanted to speak on a subject today that's very close to my heart. Um, in essence, its presence or its absence among us defines who we are or who we are not. It's one of Jesus' commands to us. 
And it's a hallmark of the character of God from the beginning. I believe that God has a desire to reach out and to help his people. He likes to be sought out. It's part of his character. He wants people to turn to him. And, and we know that not just in time of trouble, but all the time, but especially in time of trouble, God likes to hear from his people. He does hear. And he does help. And in turn, he expects the same of us. Those who identify as God's people, he expects to have a heart to help his people. Uh, Jesus gives us a glimpse of the Father's heart. I'm going to start in John chapter 15 with the words of Jesus. I'll just read verses 12 to 17 in John chapter 15. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Ye are my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends. For all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. You have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whosoever, whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. We are in need, as a human race, of saving. God was so concerned with that, and with reconciling us to him, that he sent his son to rescue us. His coming was heralded as an expression of peace and goodwill toward men in the earth. I'm going to back up a little bit in John and read out of John chapter 13, verses 31 to 35. And therefore, when he was gone out, Jesus said, Now is the Son of Man glorified, and God is glorified in him. If God be glorified in him, God shall also glorify him in himself, and shall straightway glorify him. Little children, yet a little while I am with you. Ye shall seek me, and as I said unto the Jews, Whither I go, ye cannot come. So now I say to you, A new commandment I give unto you, that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye have love one to another. I mentioned that the Lord sent his son, Jesus, down here. And as Jesus performed a supernatural act of love toward us in his living as a man, uh, the ministry that he had here, the miracles that he performed, his uh, death on the cross and his resurrection, he commanded his disciples to perform a very to perform very tangible acts of love toward each other, which would also define and would come to define who they were to all men. I think that this statement of Jesus is, is and will be damning to many groups that cling to the title of Christian. Uh, as an encouragement today, I just wanted to explore these two intertwined principles that are part of the character of God. The first part being his desire to help his people. And the second part being that his will is that his people would love and help. And that it would flow out of his people. Uh, and I just wanted to make a note before I launch into everything. That there are many ways we can reach out and love each other. There are physical acts. Sharing truth, counsel, the sum total of all of these things together is love. Uh, and if I don't touch on all of these ways specifically, or if I seem to favor more in some other way, just know that I'm, I'm not advocating for one or the other, because I think those can be ditches. Uh, when we think that love is only acting in kindness towards people, and that it doesn't include truth, I think that we're severely lacking. And if we think we can just hammer everybody with truth, and not have expressions of love, I think that that's also lacking. So, if, if my message seems to favor one or, or the other today, 
in, in any part of it. I'm, I'm not purposefully neglecting any of it because I realize that it's, it's something that's a collective. Love is a collective and it's not, it's not just one thing, which, again, like I said, I think is a trapping of, of a lot of different groups. That's where a lot of uh, no truth and all acceptance comes from or people that just have uh, all scorn and all truth but no compassion towards one another. I, I wrote down here that, that love is not always something that, um, that is comfortable either. As an example, Paul told the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians, and I will very gladly be gladly spend and be spent for you, though the more abundantly I love you, the less I be loved. Um, another way to think about that, I think, is that love is just not always immediately appreciated. Uh, sometimes it's resented at the beginning. But I think that if our hearts are right, genuine love will be received by us. Um, because we, we seek truth, we desire truth, and we want to be conformed to the image of Christ. I want to go back to the Old Testament. A, a principle from the beginning, an element of the character of God that we can see throughout the Old Testament reaching into the New. I think David was able to, uh, in his Psalms, he was able to really articulate a lot of truths about the character of God, a lot of a lot of truth about what it is to be human. And I, I wanted to start with a, a quote from Psalm 46, verses 1, 2, and 3. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore will not we fear, though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. David understood God's desire to be sought out for help. He wrote about it. A lot of the Psalms are a heart cry of David for help from God, entreating God to do something to take action. Okay, let's go back further to the book of Exodus. Exodus chapter 3. And I'll read... Uh, I'm going to read the whole chapter. I'm going to break it up a little bit, though. We'll start in verses 1 through 10. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush was burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. And when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Draw not nigh hither, but put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of the land, that land, unto a good land, and unto a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, and the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel is come unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. I just think it's interesting when I read this passage, it just seems like Moses kind of got blindsided with with God, and he's just, God is ready, he's all action, he's ready for action. He says a couple times that he's heard the cry of his people who are being afflicted by the Egyptians, and that he's ready, he's ready to help them, he's ready to reach down. And Moses, who just uh, unwittingly walks into this thing, is invited to be a direct participant God doesn't beat around uh, the bush, so to speak, with no pun intended. He, uh, 
he gets right to the point and tells Moses, you know, I'm, I'm going to help him and you're going to be part of it. Verse 11, he says, it says, And Moses said unto God, uh, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh and that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, Certainly I will be with thee, and this shall be a token unto thee that I have sent thee. When thou hast brought forth the people out of Egypt, ye shall serve God upon this mountain. And Moses said unto God, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent unto me, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to, unto them? And God said unto Moses, I am that I am. And he said, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. And God said moreover unto Moses, Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob hath sent me unto you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial unto all generations. Go and gather the elders of Israel together and say unto them, The Lord God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Jacob appeared unto me, saying, I have surely visited you and seen that which is done to you in Egypt. And I have said, I will bring you up out of the affliction of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites unto a land flowing with milk and honey, and they shall hearken to thy voice. And thou shalt come, and thou, thou and the elders of Israel unto the king of Egypt, and ye shall say unto him, The Lord God of Hebrews of the Hebrews hath met with us, and now let us go. We beseech thee three days' journey into the wilderness that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go. No, not by a mighty hand. And I will stretch out my hand and smite Egypt with all my wonders, which I will do in the midst thereof, and after that he will let you go. And I will give this people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, and it shall come to pass that when ye go, ye shall not go empty, but every woman shall borrow of her neighbor and of her that sojourneth in her house jewels of silver and jewels of gold and raiment, and ye shall put them on upon your sons and upon your daughters, and ye shall spoil the Egyptians. I, I see a pattern throughout Scripture, and I wanted to use this example that God, when he hears a cry, when he hears a prayer, can and will answer supernaturally. He references it here in this passage, that he's going to afflict Pharaoh with many great signs and wonders from heaven. But he's also setting up a very flesh and blood minister for the people. Somebody in the flesh. And it's going to be Moses. And I, I have to think about, after the Israelites got out of there, um, from the time of Moses up until Samuel, there were judges that governed people. And there was a closeness maintain, maintained to some degree with the Lord. When Moses judged the people, his father-in-law observed this thing, Jethro, and he criticized Moses. Moses would spend from the dawning of the day until the evening hearing the problems of the people, ministering to them, giving them wisdom. And I, I think this is something that, that I can see in the New Testament too, which we'll touch on a little bit later, but his father-in-law criticized him and said, you are going to burn yourself out. You can't keep this up. You can't listen to everybody's problems all day long. He was performing a very practical act of service and help to his people, but it was overwhelming to him because he was also uh, he was also a point of contact for the people to God. And uh, and Jethro advised him to find people who were all about the mission among the Israelites. Find people who could be entrusted to care for the people who were not greedy, who were not unrighteous, and set them up as people who could act kind of as sub-judges for these people and help them through their problems so that Moses would have an opportunity to maintain that connection to the Lord. And Moses took his father-in-law up on that advice. God's desire was to stay close to his people, and we can kind of see this... Uh, 
see this up to Samuel, where then the people suffered a degree of separation. And I want to jump ahead to that. It's in 1 Samuel, chapter 12, uh, verses 1 to 13. Okay, so they've reached the point now where the people are starting to, uh, they're starting to beg for a king. They're, they're done with judges. They have rejected Samuel's children as the future judges. And they're now asking Samuel directly, set a king up over us so that we can be like the other nations of the world. This thing is displeasing to Samuel. It's displeasing to the Lord. But the Lord allows the people to have their heart's desire. And this is the culmination of that. So Saul has been anointed king. Um, he's found later hiding and and then there comes a point where the Israelites are attacked by uh, by the children of Ammon and Nahash the king they're threatened by them and uh, the Lord allows anger to be kindled in the heart of Saul, who's the new anointed king. He comes and delivers the people, and then Samuel kind of culminates the whole thing with passing the baton from his seat as a judge to the seat of the throne, uh, Saul the king. But it doesn't come without a warning, and, it, it, and here's that warning. This is the culmination of that. And Samuel said unto all Israel, Behold, I have hearkened unto your voice in all that she said unto me, and have made a king over you. And now behold, the king walketh before you, and I am old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my childhood unto this day. Behold, here I am, witness against me before the Lord and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken, or whose ass have I taken? Or whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Or of whose hand have I received any bribe to blind mine eyes therewith? And I will restore it you. And they said, Thou hast not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither hast thou taken aught of any man's hand. And he said unto them, The Lord is witness against you, and and his anointed is witness this day, that ye have not found aught in my hand. And they answered, He is witness. And Samuel said unto the people, It is the Lord that advanced Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now therefore stand still, that I may reason with you before the Lord of all the righteous acts of the Lord, which he did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried unto the Lord, then the Lord sent Moses and Aaron, which brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them dwell in this place. And when they forgot the Lord their God, he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the host of Hazor, and unto the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. And they cried unto the Lord, and said, We have sinned, because we have forsaken the Lord, and have served Balaam and Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies, and we will serve thee. And the Lord sent Jerubbaal, Jerubal, and Baden, and Jeph- Jephthah and Samuel delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and ye dwelled safe. And when ye saw that Nahash, this is their latest afflictor, their latest attacker, the king of the children of Ammon came against you, you said unto me, Nay, but give, but a king shall reign over us, when the Lord your God was your king. Just pause there for a minute. This is where I see this. There's a degree of separation added that was not desirable from the Lord between God and his people. I don't really know, like by function and way of of how um, a judge acted and a king acted in their office and what was different. I can't really point to exactly what was different other than the fact that a king would, uh, in his rule, just by nature of who he was and who he who he was going to be and having armies was going to afflict his own people a little bit by pulling some of their sons and daughters for special jobs and service of the king. I don't necessarily see that with a judge. But beyond that, the overarching principle here is that there was an added degree of separation. They lost something that was precious to them in accepting a king and desiring a king over them. Because before, the king king was the Lord. And they lost it. Now therefore, behold the king whom ye have chosen and whom ye have desired. And behold, the Lord hath set a king over you. 
If ye will fear the Lord and serve him and obey his voice and not rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall both ye and also the king that reigneth over you continue following the Lord your God. But if ye will not obey the voice of the Lord, but rebel against the commandment of the Lord, then shall the hand of the Lord be against you as it was against your fathers. Um, And the rest of the chapter kind of continues that way. Um, The conditional statements about like, if you serve me, um, I'll preserve you and your king, and if you fail to serve me, it will not go well with you. So I think that part of what, what the Lord was doing was restoring some of that lost connection that he had with his people. These principles of God's character were never really lost nor changed. His goal was that access to him by his people could be restored. And this was accomplished through Christ. I want to go to the book of Hebrews. Chapter 4, verses 14 and 16. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. God was so desirous to have this connection with us that he came in the flesh. He lived as a man. He was no longer only a creator, but he was also a fellow man who could fully appreciate and know the human experience. Uh, I, I thought about this passage before that like, when you think of the structure of a, of a big company here, somebody that has a CEO in charge. That CEO cannot and is not in tune with the man who's the janitor that goes and cleans the bathroom and sweeps the floors. He doesn't know what that guy's life is like every day. But our creator knows that. He knows those things. He's he's been on the lowest level. He's been with us, and he knows what the human experience is like. That's what this passage is saying. And I believe and I believe it's very unique too. Okay, I'm going to jump ahead to chapter 9. And read verses uh, 6 to 28. Now when these things were thus ordained, the priests went always into the first tabernacle accomplishing the service of God. This is talking about how the sins of the people were dealt with in in Old Testament times, under the Mosaic Law, this, this is how people were cleansed from sins. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, but for the errors of the people. So, I don't know if you caught that there, but this priest that went in was himself unclean. He was impure, and so he had to offer a sacrifice for himself, in addition to bringing sacrifices for the people. The Holy Ghost, this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as at the first, as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure for the time then present, in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the surface perfect as pertaining to the conscience, which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. So so in other words, these things that were being accomplished on earth, having this holiest of holies where people would go, not people, but the one priest would go and offer up sacrifices for the sins of himself and the people were really only a type of something that was not on the earth but was existing in in the heavens. But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, in other words, it was not a physical place here on the earth, 
which things were only a type of things that existed in the celestial. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? And for this cause, he is the mediator of the New Testament, that by means of death, for the redemption of the transgressions that were first under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of an eternal inheritance. For where a testament is, there must also of necessity be the death of the testator. For a testament is a force after men are dead, otherwise it is of no strength, at all while the testator liveth, whereupon neither the first testament was dedicated without blood. For as had spoken every precept to the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and of goats with water and scarlet wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the testament which God hath enjoined unto you. Moreover, he sprinkled with blood both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood, and without shedding of blood is no remission. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, which are the figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us, Nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with blood of others. For then must he have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once, one time, in the end of the world, hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So, so the overall arching theme, if I could just kind of recap here, is that in, in Old Testament times, the sins of the people, including the high priest, had to be atoned with yearly sacrifices in a tabernacle, which was only a representative of what was happening in the heavenly places. Jesus himself had the power and the authority to offer one sacrifice, once and for all, by blood, in the heavenly place before the Father, and was restoring some of that relationship that had been lost, or all of it. Not some of it, all of it. Okay, so that was like pretty lofty, that's pretty supernatural What I wanted to bring out in in reading all of that is that Christ came to minister to his people because one of the character traits of God is to be sought out, is to help his people. So Jesus came fulfilling a supernatural act, something that could not be done by any man, something very lofty, offering a sacrifice in a supernatural way that can't be offered by any mere man. So how do you move from the supernatural to the practical? Just thinking about Jesus' ministry here on earth, he ministered in the supernatural. He suffered and died as a man. He resurrected uh, for the remission of sins. He ministered while he was here in signs and wonders. But what about his charge to us? Love one another as I have loved you. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, Paul calls himself and those that are with him ambassadors for Christ to the Corinthians. They're representatives of Christ here on this earth. And he was referring to himself in that way in their relationship to the Corinthians. They were ambassadors or representatives of Christ to them. So I wanted to go through some scriptures and just provide a few examples. Real practical, down-to-earth examples of how God expects us, as he loves us and does things for us in the supernatural, in turn expects us to do very unsupernatural things for each other. Very practical things. Uh, let's just start in Galatians chapter 6. 
verse 10, it says, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them of the household of faith. Uh, I just wanted to make a quick note here in that, in that little verse. It doesn't say, as you have permission, let's do good unto all men. It says, as you have opportunity. And I'm, I'm just a big advocate, I, I think, in our culture for whatever reason. And I, I think I've said this before, that um, if somebody asks you if you'd like help, or if, if you ask somebody else for help, uh, we're kind of trained and conditioned to just say no. Um, so, as long as, as you feel like you could do it without hurting somebody or stepping on their toes, I think it's better to just take opportunity rather than to wait for permission. I think that's a really healthy way to, to help each other. Okay, James chapter 5, verses 8 through 20. Be also patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest ye be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth before the door. Take, my brethren, the prophets who have spoken in the name of the Lord for an example of suffering and affliction and of patience. Behold, we count them happy which endure. Ye have heard of the patience of Job, and have seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very pitiful and of tender mercy. But above all things, my brethren, swear not, neither by heaven, neither by the earth, neither by any other oath, but let your yea be yea, and your nay, nay, lest you fall into condemnation. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church, and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick, and the Lord shall raise him up. And if he have committed sins, they shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that ye may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again and the heaven gave rain and the earth brought forth her fruit. Brethren, if any of you do err from the truth and one convert him let him know that he which converted the sinner from the error of his way shall save a soul from death and shall hide a multitude of sins. Uh, just a couple of quick takeaways from this passage. It's healthy among brothers to not hold grudges. It's healthy to confess faults to each other and to be praying for each other. It is very healthy to bring each other back to the truth. Um, those are some really practical things that as brothers we can do to take care of each other. I uh, want to read real quick 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 31. For as the body is one, and hath many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made, all made to drink into one Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, Because I am not the hand, I am not of the body, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, Because I am not the eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? But now hath God set the members, every one of them, in the body as it hath pleased him. And if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are they many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, nor again to the head, to the feet, I have no need of you. Nay, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable upon these, we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need, but God hath tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to that part which lacked. 
that there should be no schism in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. I just wanted to highlight that there, that there wouldn't be any division in the body, and that the members, which are us, of the body, would be caring for one another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, or one member be honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now ye are the body of Christ, and members in particular. And God hath set some in the church, first apostles, secondarily prophets, thirdly teachers, after that miracles, then gifts of healings, helps, governments, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. I just, I just wanted to reflect a little bit on this passage and think about, he said that it's important that the members of the body have not a schism, and that they care for one another. How important was that? To these, to these first Christians. To make sure that that part of the body was functioning, that it was working, that we were caring for one another. Let's take a really quick look at the book of Acts and see what the first church thought of that, how important it was to them. Chapter 6, just a few verses there. Verses 1 through 8. Then said the high, I'm sorry, uh, chapter 6. And in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration, which was a passing out of food uh, for the early church at that time. That's, That's what it's talking about specifically here. Then the twelve called the multitude of the disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men, of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude, and they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmenius, Parmenus, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles, and when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them, and the word of God increased, and the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Uh, There was some supernatural ministering there, the twelve apostles, um, were finding themselves short on time. And like Moses, they chose to appoint people who were on board with the mission, full of the Holy Ghost, to give people time that they didn't have. To make sure that people were being ministered to, not only in a supernatural way by God, but also on a very practical level, which was important. Passing out food for widows. There was nothing supernatural about that. And again, I'm not saying that there was that there was no supernatural, that it was all practical. I mean, it says faith there that Stephen was full of faith and power and, and did great wonders and miracles among the people. I have a friend of mine uh, that, that has said over the years that sometimes what people need is just a little bit of Jesus in the flesh. And what these widows were needing was the body of Christ to act in a very real and practical way and make sure that they weren't neglected, that they were getting enough food to eat. One of the most precious gifts that we have is what these men were giving the people. It's finite. We all only have so much. It was their time. Because it's finite, because we only have so much, it is the most valuable resource of ours that we can give to each other, is time. and making sure that we have it for one another. I, uh, I wanted to kind of wrap it up by, by sharing, a, I guess, a personal testimony that I, I don't share very much, um, or at all, I guess. It's, it's pretty humbling, 
when I was a boy, especially after junior high school, um, I used to hear my dad say a lot that, and he, and he would say this to his nieces and his nephews and to me and my brother. Uh, he had this little speech that he would give. And, uh, and he would say, there's going to come a time, and I don't know when it is, when you're going to find yourself somewhere and you're going to realize that it's the wrong place to be. And you're going to need help. And, uh, and I want you to know that um, if it's 3 o'clock in the morning or any time of day, if you call me, I'll answer and I'll come and get you. I won't ask a lot of questions. I'll just come and get you out of there, wherever it is. And I, I always had imagined that maybe what he was like alluding to was some kind of a wild party scene or something that's really unfavorable and your conscience gets the best of you. And so you reach out for help and then he would kind of, you know, ride in and, and help you. And again, he extended this to his nieces, his nephews, and, and to me and my brother. I never really thought that I would that I would take advantage of that. When I was in junior high and high school, I, I played a sport... Um, I wrestled, and uh, and I enjoyed it. I did pretty well at it. Um, when I when I was in my first year of high school, so I was 16 years old. I I went out for another season, and it was pretty intense. Uh, in wrestling you're matched up against somebody who's in a weight range that, that you would match. So, you know, like a, a hundred and, there might be a weight class called a hundred and, the 130 pound weight class, which would be a range of like 124 pounds to 130 pounds, so that you're not, you're, the idea is that you're evenly matched, somebody who, who would be close to you and you're not being squashed by someone a lot bigger or, or whatever. So we were divided into, into weight classes and at the time, it's now uh, illegal. But at the time, there was a lot of pressure from coaches to, uh, to try to drop weight down. Um, I think I had, in high school, I had something ridiculously low, like 5.5% like body fat or something. There's just nothing to lose in a, in a boy that's that size and that age. So a lot of the weight that we cut was water weight. Um, and we practiced that. And we would try to, in order to maybe gain a competitive edge on people, you would try, the goal was to cut your weight down to the next lower weight class and then compete with people there. And they enforced these weight classes um, when you would have what we would call a wrestling meet, which is when two schools would get together and, and you know, the people of the same weights would wrestle. Before you wrestled, you would have what they called a weigh-in. And, and I remember making it by, by the tenth of an ounce a few times for the weight class I was trying to get down to. In order to keep this weight off, uh, especially days when we would have a, a wrestling match, um, we would come in early and we would put layers of clothing on, usually a jacket, sweatpants, a hat, and we would run around the gym and if we could, we'd make sure the heat was up because we would try to shed as much of this water weight as we could. It was very unhealthy, it was very stressful. I used to complain that I just couldn't ever see daylight um, because if there was no morning practice, we'd go in early and, and either lift weights or run laps around the gym. Or uh, if it was after school, we would practice till after dark and then finally go home. Uh, my breakfast was usually a can of orange juice and then maybe a hard boiled egg and then I, I would just have a real light lunch and maybe some nuts after school. If we had a meet, we'd ride the bus and kind of sit next to the heater with our hoodies on and, and, and clothes, and we would spit into a bottle just to lose that last little bit of extra weight if we could. I'm not proud of these things, but I just am trying to paint a picture of what, what it's like for a 15 or a 16-year-old to be in an environment like that. It was very stressful. Um, we were pushed to the degree we started with about 20 guys that season, and by the end, uh, when this happened, uh, there were only three guys on the wrestling team because everybody had dropped off due to sickness, injury, or just burnout. We had a morning practice, and the gym that we worked out in was several blocks from school. I'd say it was about a half mile. It was winter time. Um,
usually after a morning practice, there was a separate room that wasn't the locker room that we would weigh in at, and uh, and that was the routine. You know, you'd you'd work out and then you would weigh yourself and see where you were at so you could adjust what you did that day to make sure you could make weight or stay on track. I got forgotten about one morning. And the, uh, the coach locked the locker room where my clothes for the day were and where the showers were. And so I, I went to the separate room and weighed myself. The gym was locked up. Everybody was gone. And I tried the door, and it was stuck. And I was in my shorts and my sweaty T-shirt. School started in about a half hour. And uh, I didn't know what to do with myself. And the stress of everything I'd been describing was mounting. And I, uh, I broke down and I wept because I didn't know what to do. And there was a payphone there, and I called my dad collect. And I couldn't talk. And he just said, I'm coming. And he got me. And he pulled me out of school. He canceled his work. He took me out to breakfast. He spent the day with me. He called the coach and gave him a piece of his mind and said he was pushing boys too hard. And he went to bat for me. And uh, I just have a vision that we could do that for each other in church and be that for each other. We can minister to each other in the practical. God will take care of the supernatural. I wanted to close with Romans 12.10. Be kindly affectioned, one to another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. I'm so thankful to be able to fellowship with you all and, and share my life with you all. I'll just open it up for comment. God bless you all. And I would just like to say that I appreciate what was shared uh, on the opening and, uh, and the other um, main sermon. I don't have much to add. I, this principle of, uh, I guess it's a principle of um, doing right or doing truth. Uh, um, I don't know where it's found, but it's... Uh, the truth will set us free. So anytime, anytime we embrace truth or do truth, it will set us free in whatever circumstances we find ourselves. Thank you, Brother Max. You, you used the word supernatural, I think at least three times, maybe more. And that's, uh, I guess Webster would define that as undefinable. So his love is undefinable. It's infinite, so much higher than our ways. And um, My wife said to me, when you gave your testimony, I appreciate, appreciate it, brother. And she said, you were laughing when he was crying. I said, I was laughing at when he was in the undershorts and the thing, and he had a predicament, but I had tears in my eyes also. So <laughs> it wasn't. But uh, I, I think of the... A few of the parables, and you could have touched. You did a very uh, great job, better than I could have done, as if that's anything for me. But anyway, uh, the parables you could have touched on, of course, was uh, uh, the prodigal son, the father of the love, the good Samaritan, or the, the two sons. One uh, said he'd do his will and things like that. But um, so far as love goes, I'm a papa. I, I learn from everybody. Uh, in the great things. And I, like you, Brother Max, I thank the Lord for all you people here. I just want to say thank you, too, for that message and really appreciate it. Oh, yes. oh just uh, <clears throat> 
yeah, I, I guess I don't have much to add. Just, just realizing how there's something about time that, <clears throat> like, just giving somebody some of our time, how much that, how, how valuable that is to that person. Uh, we all have it. We all have time, but uh, we're all inclined to be pretty selfish with it. And yeah, I just don't know. Uh, I can just I can think of of times in my life when. Somebody may have done something for me, <clears throat> and whatever little thing that they maybe gave me or or helped me with, uh, is is more easily forgotten than the fact that they they had a few minutes or an hour or they had some time uh, that they took. That they sacrificed themselves uh, to help me, and so anyway, I just I just want to be. I want to. I want to prefer prefer one another and esteem each other higher than myself. And thanks, brother. Um, it, your testimony just reminded me of how acts of kindness, even though they may not seem that big, really leave an impression on someone's life um, that lasts for years. Um, also, it's a good reminder to remember that if we have acts of unkindness, those can do the same effect just the other way. Anyways, I, it's something I thought of. Teach me, O oh Lord, to number my days.